so I don't forget. Today we've got a very special session because I'm, I'm really excited to um, introduce you to one of my favourite. I'm not sure if we're collaborators. We've worked uh, we've worked together on things, not specific pieces of work, but um, teaching courses and stuff. But Ernest Mboise, who's uh, from Makere University in Kampala. Um, I'm trying to remember the year that I first met Ernest. It would probably be about 10 years ago at um, a Dagstuhl meeting on machine learning. At the time, Ernest was doing his PhD at Groningen University, but also in collaboration with Makere University in Kampala under the supervision of John Quinn. And uh, it just, uh, I mean, the quality of his work, but also the utility of Ernest's work in terms of where he's deploying it going, uh, as you'll see, I, I don't need to talk too much about that, uh, significantly impressed me. And, and since then, uh, Ernest and I have talked together, drunk together, I think even danced together at various <laughs> meetings. <laughs> so, um, but I'm constantly impressed by the quality of, of his work in, in deploying machine learning technologies uh, sort of in the field in, in ways that, and, and being ahead of, uh, you know, almost anyone else I know in uh, his ability to do that. Um, what's particularly interesting is he's sort of experienced this change of this shift where those technologies used to be based on classical machine learning techniques and more recently deploying on mobile phones using deep neural networks. So he's um, one of the most expert people I know in this domain um, and uh, also a great lecturer. And he's very keen to make this an interactive session. So please do pop your questions in the, um, in the chat as you, as you like, as we go through. Um, and what we'll make sure is um, we'll sort of interrupt to uh, answer those questions as we go. But um, uh, so without further ado, um, yeah, I should say as well, Ernest is now, he's now, I think, back at Macquarie University. Um, uh, are you senior lecturer there, uh, um, Ernest? I can't remember. But, but before that, you were, he had a recent spell at Google AI in Accra, where he was one of the founder members of Google's AI lab in Ghana. Um, but uh, back at Macquarie University now. Um, over to you, Ernest. And you can fill in any gaps where I uh, got it wrong. <laughs> Yeah, I think I danced, I danced really well, better, <laughs> better, better than uh, most. All right, okay, that's just a joke. Uh, so actually, uh, things have moved on quite a bit. So we started this organization called Sunbird AI as well. So it's a not-for-profit that does uh, artificial intelligence research. So that's a big part. And then oh yeah, course, that's right. Yeah, Sunbird AI. I'm going to put links into that chat for that. Sunbird AI, which is a focused not for profit as well, which you're doing a lot on. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Carry on. Uh, Sorry, I forgot. Some things mentioned that. Sure. All right. So I guess I'll. Uh, 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 do you want me to jump right into the? Yes, please go ahead. Chat? Jump right in. Okay, cool. Let me share my screen. All right, uh, can you see my screen? Yep, it's perfect. All right, great. Okay, so great. So it's good to be here. Uh, good to, to share this, uh, this lecture. So Neil did ask me to, to share some of the work we've been doing here in, in Kampala in Uganda. And a lot of this work is done under the auspices of Makere University Artificial Intelligence Lab. So it's been a, a data science uh, AI lab for quite a bit of time and we've done quite a bit of work. So I'll talk about uh, some, of the, some of the work we've done, the challenges, and hopefully it will generate some, some, uh, some interest. So maybe just to scope it, uh, uh, so how can deep learning help in, in, in sort of these challenges we, we call developmental challenges? So I think developmental challenges are sort of challenges which are circumscribed to you know, developing countries. And these tend to be characterized by you know, shortage of experts. So you have um, experts like maybe medical doctors or experts in plant pathology or experts in languages or whatever, they tend to be limited. Um, and then you have less standardization and then you know, limited resources. So that's sort of one 
Uh, and so deep learning can, can offer some help in these areas. And then you also have the nature of tasks. So you have these time intensive tasks um, or expert tasks. And you know, these are some things that deep learning uh, is really good at, uh, at, at correcting and then scale of, of, of the research as well. All right, so I'll, uh, uh, there's many things we've done in the lab, but I think in this, this, uh, this lecture, I really focus on applications of, uh, in agriculture. All right, so <clears throat> how, do you, how do you, I think the first question sort of from a developing world context is how do you decide what's the biggest problem to work on? So there are different types of problems. Um, so agriculture is, it tends to be quite big because, you know, it's, uh, you know, 75% of, of the people, for example, in Uganda, their livelihood is based on agriculture. And that basically means from agriculture, they get their, they, they get the food they eat, some of the food they eat, uh, some of the food, which is a lot, they sell it and get, um, resources for healthcare or taking children to school or, you know, doing some other social activities. So, you know, their livelihood uh, is pegged a bit to agriculture, big number of people. And so what's the biggest crop in agriculture? So cassava tends to be the biggest crop uh, there. And this is what it looks like. So this image here on your, um, on your, on your left or on your right. So cassava has edible roots. So these, uh, these roots here, so the, the roots are edible and it takes about nine to 12 months to, grow and mature and it, it, uh, it's a food security crop uh, third largest source of carbs here and, you know i think the biggest thing is that it's quite robust under diverse weather conditions so we did focus on this crop um, the idea being if we can sort out the problems there then you know you're sorting out the livelihoods of you know 75 percent of the population so you know good reason to to do work there and uh, so what are the problems in cassava uh, so this crop has heavy losses. There've been heavy losses over time, uh, mainly related to disease. Diseases in, uh, in this crop tend to be severe, some of them wiping out whole gardens. So we, we decided to focus on this. Uh, so what are the um, sort of tasks you can think of doing in uh, machine learning or deep learning specifically? So, one of them is uh, disease diagnosis, um, so diagnostics. And why is this important? Because this tends to be quite resource expensive in expert time, uh, in time and money. So this gentleman, you see this image here on the, on the right. Um, so these are, these are experts you know, in the field. So ideally how they do diagnosis is they go out to the field uh, these are cassava plants. So these, these, these are young cassava plants. Normally they grow quite, quite tall. And they look at the leaves and um, from the leaves, they, they can sort of de detect whether this is diseased or not. <clears throat> so what, what sort of types of, um, of uh, deep learning sort of solutions can you think of in this area, for example? Does, does anyone have a... Some idea? Pop it in the chat or unmute. What sort of things? Oh, David's saying, I don't know if you see the chat. David yeah, mentioned know. computer vision. Yeah. Oh, okay. Computer vision, uh, definitely. All right. So we'll, we'll, let's let's go with that. Let's go with computer vision. So maybe we do computer vision. Uh, so since they sort of look at, as you can see, the experts tend to look at these things visually, they, they sort of eyeball them and from there determine this is so computer vision seems like the right type of task. Uh, so how do we do it? Um, so we, we opted for smartphone based diagnosis. Um, and since they diagnose disease on the leaves of the, of the crops, uh, this is sort of an app we did very early on, very early on. Uh, so you have a phone, it's a cheap phone. This is a couple of years ago. And what you want is take a photo or a video and then uh, the phone gives you some level of disease. Uh, so this is sort of the basic idea. 
and and so we're basically going through how we did it <clears throat> so how would you do it so first step I, I suppose is you have to collect the images so data collection is uh, it tends to be a big big task in, in neural networks when you want to train these things so the first row up there is um, a row of the types of diseases that are common in cassava plants. So you see what a healthy leaf looks like. And then from a healthy leaf, you can see what the four diseased uh, leaves look like. So these, the tags, the labels there, CVB, CGM, CMD, CBSD are types of diseases in, in cassava. And you can see they manifest differently. Some manifest with uh, decolorization and spots. Others have more detailed spots. Others have, you know, they deform the leaf, decolorize it a bit. Um, so this looks like a good computer vision task. So what makes it more complex is each of these diseases has levels of severity. So for example, the, the row which is down it has severity levels of cassava mosaic disease, the CMD. And you can see what level one looks like as a healthy plant. And then you can see the, the level, levels of, um, of, of severity of disease in, uh, in, in the other classes. So normally it's five levels of severity and we have five, um, five diseases. All right, so this looks like a, a good sort of task for computer vision. Um, so any, any, any ideas how we can go about this? You know, how, how do we delve into this? Can you see the chat? David's saying uh, produce a texture map. Do you want to expand? I, unmute and expand on that if you're happy to, David. Uh, okay, yeah, now I have the chat, yeah. Sure, yeah, so um, I was thinking, yeah, you could produce a texture map to get uh, shape agnostic um like a shape agnostic image uh which you can then um, maybe do some uh deep learning on um so you can i think that's a nice like pre-processing step that you could that you could do interesting um so why, why do you want to get uh perhaps the question there would be why do you want to get a shape agnostic uh representation because shape tends to be an identifier for some of the diseases, deformities in. Uh, yeah, that's, I, I was, I guess I was thinking because um, you maybe wouldn't necessarily want the um, uh, like deformations or angle to affect your prediction. So maybe you could have the texture as one input and then the shape as a separate feature uh, that you could then use. Indeed, indeed. Um, cool, very interesting. So actually that's what we did very earlier on before the event of, uh, of deep neural networks and, and, and convolutional neural networks. Uh, we sort of went in and tried to extract all these features as you see, maybe the texture, maybe the shape features, color features and uh, generate some feature vector and then run some algorithms over that. Uh, I suppose with the, um, with the, uh, with the event of deep learning, we, we, we sort of went uh, into other directions. So I'll talk about some considerations we had when collecting data. So the idea is to collect a large set of data and see if we can just run some uh, neural network, convolutional neural network and can extract all those features. As you say, David, maybe it extracts texture somewhere and shape and you know it does whatever it does, uh, extracts those features and then maybe that's a better a way to do this. Okay, so <clears throat> one idea was a single leaf versus uh, the whole plant. Uh, so I, I, I will show some images about this, but the idea is, um, so a leaf in cassava is a five or seven lobed uh, leaf. So if you look at this image down here, the, the, the first image on the second row, that is sort of a leaf of a cassava plant. But the way the experts do it actually is they look at uh, the leaf, but they also look at the plant. So the leaf is sort of part of a plant. You want to tell if the plant is diseased or not. Uh, so that's one consideration. Are you going to collect images of a whole leaf or a whole plant? So these affect how you will train. Um, 
background versus no background. I think part of your, uh, your, your answer, David, there was sort of how do you extract uh, as much information without the noise? Um, and this is, this is another consideration you have to make. And, um, and then you have <clears throat> the idea of single class versus multiple classes. And I'll just show an example here. So <clears throat> single leaf versus the whole plant. So you, you see the image on the, on the right is sort of a single leaf. It's well done, cropped out, a nice image to sort of put into a CNN. And the image on the right is sort of what you tend to get in the field. So this is a section of a cassava plant. <clears throat> You can see it has a, an interesting background and the leaves are sort of in the foreground. And you can see some leaves tend to be healthy, some are diseased. And so this is what a typical um, field image would be. So you see there'll be some difference between <clears throat> uh, very well curated images for training and uh, what you eventually get in the field. So if you're getting data sets online, you'll probably get the data set, which is on the right, well curated, leaf in the middle. Uh, but how do you deal with uh, data that looks exactly like the one on the left? And then <clears throat> labeling, annotation. So the next task, you know, you want to annotate the data and say so this leaf represents this disease. Um, so, um, yeah, so, <clears throat> You could have a single label. You could say, I'm, I'm, I'm assigning this whole image one label. So this is a representation of a certain disease. In this case, maybe cassava mosaic disease. Um, what else could you do? How else could you label this uh, image perhaps? Is there any other way you could think of annotating this? Any thoughts on that? Can't be David all the time. Someone else. <laughs> so David suggesting add in the severity of the disease as well. All right. Um, all right. Other so thoughts could... on labeling. Robert's mentioning annotate the image with a box that showcases the disease. Mm -hmm. All right. Interesting ideas. Other thoughts? I can think of at least one other thing. Here we go. Um, Yulong Lin is suggesting perhaps it could be a multi class problem for the different diseases of the first stage. And then we have separate classifiers for severities uh, specific to each disease. Uh, so I think what I understand you long saying is, is, is that are you suggesting we partition it some sort of image segmentation as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Very interesting ideas. So actually those are <clears throat> um, worthwhile things to consider. So I guess the first uh, is sort of can we segment out where they the, the leaves are or images or diseases. So actually you could have a multi-level thing and you have your bounding boxes. As you can see, these bounding boxes have, um, so this, this plant actually manifests two diseases. So you have CGM and CMD, and you can also assign severity uh, levels to that. So as someone proposed, um, so that's, <clears throat> that's another way you could label the data. Uh, and maybe more segmentation. So you could, if you really wanted to, to go deeper, you could also say, okay, I see disease in this section of the, of the leaf and maybe I can segment it out very carefully. And so this part of the, of the plant represents this particular disease. Um, so sort of a pixel level uh, type of segmentation. Uh, but these, <clears throat> all these are very good, but you know, so what, what, what works in practice or what, what would you do in practice? Uh, so, so one, one question of course that occurred to us was, okay, you have a hundred K images. Uh, first of all, it's an expert task to label these. So you have to figure out 
as you can see what disease it is, uh, you need some level of um, expertise in this, this area. Um, and then how do you collect 100K images? So one way is to, to, to go out and collect 100K images. But what we actually did was to, to ask farmers throughout the country to send us images of uh, crops in their garden. Uh, so that's just another long story on how, how, how to do that well, how to incentivize them to send them. But they did send these, uh, you know, <clears throat> around 100K, 90K images. And so the task became, how do we annotate all, all these 100K images? It became very complicated. So what, one, one thing we did was <clears throat> got some experts, put them in a room and said, okay, let's annotate for a day. Let's see how far we can get in a day. And, um, and, uh, and, and so the experts, you know, labeling is a complicated task because so you have to draw, get a good software that draws a bounding box, labels it, labels the image, labels the, where the bounding box is, gives it a, a label, etc. So what we did, we paired <clears throat> experts uh, with someone in the lab, sit down and say, okay, uh, you pair, uh, try and uh, label <clears throat> as much information, as many images as you can in a day. And um, they were able to label maybe what, 900, you know, 700 to 900 images in a day. So quick math question. <laughs> so how long would it take to label, you know, 100K images roughly uh, if, if, you know, you had to label about 100K, uh, about 900, 700 to 900 images a day in terms of weeks. Everyone got that one? 100K images, 700 to 900 a day. It's great when you read about image set. Three years, we're getting one uh, proposal. Uh, there's a wonderful thing. If, one, if you read the backstory on ImageNet collection, this is a Fei Fei Li did this calculation for the 14 million images of ImageNet. And <laughs> yeah, you come up with some extraordinary numbers of that. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> maybe the short of it, I, I guess, is uh, this why I ask this question is that it takes so long. It takes, you know, maybe <clears throat> 14, 16, 18 weeks. <clears throat> if you have dedicated experts seated there doing this for, eight to 10 hours a day labeling this. So that's at the minimum, you have three months of an expert's time seated there every day. Uh, and this, this is not, uh, this is not possible. You can't, it's, the experts are few, they are quite busy going to the field. So it becomes quite complicated to do a very good labeling. And this is labeling uh, like this, you know, just putting a bounding box. So if you really wanted to go down to something more sophisticated like pixel-wise labels, <clears throat> it's, it's almost impossible to do this in reasonable, in practical time, I think that should be the one. We had quite an interesting question that, that I thought also related to the thing you were making about people, the mechanism designed for people to provide data. What do the experts do when the disease is encountered in the farmer's gardens? Do they destroy the plants or what's the next step? Yeah, so that <clears throat> that is a that is a very interesting question, and we sort of come down to that uh, later on. But what they do, depending on the disease, so some diseases like cassava brown streak, uh, they, they 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 clear the garden basically. They they ask the farmer to uproot everything and destroy it. And if the experts normally they pay, they they sort of pay for the the expected yield and harvest. <clears throat> some other diseases, depending on the severity. <clears throat> and on the variety of the of the of the of the cassava that is grown, they'll leave it in, uh, but the yield will reduce. So your yield may come down fifty percent or thirty percent. All others, the, you know, the advice is to spray. Can you spray um, uh, spray the images, etc. Um, <clears throat> Nice question yes. from oh. Robert. How do you know that you need 100,000 labeled examples? Why not 10,000? Yes, uh, that, is a, <clears throat> that is a hard, uh, that's a hard, uh, a hard thing to determine. I don't know if it's been determined actually in theory of, of uh, 
deep neural networks, what's the required amount of data is. But I think how we did, how we, how we did it, at least is to do it empirically, <clears throat> collect a small set and see the accuracy there, uh, bootstrap some of the, the latest uh, uh, methodology, transfer learning, ETC, um, augmentation, and see if that works, and then you know, collect more data. But I think the, <clears throat> the, the rule of thumb is basically the more data you have, uh, probably the better uh, for your algorithm. Um, so that's not, actually we did collect 10K, not 100K here. So your estimates of 100K for three months times, yeah, times 10. Yeah, maybe, maybe three years actually, maybe around that. So <clears throat> we did collect... just one quick other question, um, uh, uh, which was, uh, I guess, which is whether you presumably geotag all these images to predict the hotspots in advance that's part of the collection is it uh, that you can get the geotagging off the phones as well right yes yes so <clears throat> so that's why we actually we really wanted the farmers sending their data so initially we did uh, when we we're really prototyping this we had the team sort of go out and, and basically go to a small localized area and collect data uh, but when we asked the farmers so we thought you know we need some geotags uh, connected to this data, so to understand, you know, maybe some density of disease. And so we asked farmers throughout the country to send in uh, this data. So that, that was actually an interesting sort of other aspect of this, of this proposal, uh, this project. Cool. All right, uh, yeah, did I get all the questions, the questions moment, I think, yeah, I think so. All right, cool. All right, <clears throat> so modeling. You know, so we get to modeling, you have your data, maybe you've annotated it differently, you know, in a certain way. Uh, you want to use a convolutional neural net. So how do you go about doing this uh, practice? So you need to decide which architecture. And, uh, and this, this was a bit of a problem. You know, you, you, you can, I think we tried several things. You can build your own architecture, uh, but you know, that there's not much, um, there's not uh, good performance there. And so you brought one of the other architectures, maybe a ResNet, ResNet 50, 101, is it MobileNet? And so here the considerations are, okay, how do we want to deploy this? So you want it deployed with farmers in the field. So you want it deployed on something like a mobile phone. And so that sort of <clears throat> determines what sort of architecture we want to, to use. So I think in our case, we used mobile, the, the mobile net, uh, uh, series of architectures um, for this, uh, but that you know, that's sort of a consideration you have to make. All right, so I see a question here. Could a crop ever deliberately be infected with the disease to then take photos? Um, but experts wouldn't need the classification step. <clears throat> Very interesting question. So we did, um, so you could do that. Um, so to inoculate a, a, a cassava plant is very, <clears throat> it's not straightforward. So you have to do it in a screenhouse uh, where you know, you know uh, vectors are not going to come and give it another disease. So as I showed you that plant, you can have multiple diseases on a crop. So you want to protect it. If you want to do what you're saying, you want to protect it from other infectants. So you get it and you can um, inoculate it in the lab. So we did this with, the, uh, with some plants, but at that point we are trying to understand the evolution of disease and see if we can capture it before it manifests in the leaf. But this is possible theoretically, but it's very hard to do um, at scale to get many images. Also, you don't really get the, the context where you're going to use the application. So you want to use it in the field with the farmer. So you really want a crop that has been diseased in the, in the field and has been diseased by you know, either vectors flying in or maybe they planted the poor material. So you want to get as much of that context in the image as you can. Um, so. <clears throat> so theoretically, yes, Charles, you could do it, but you know, we wanted to go with the uh, method as close to the context as possible. So here's one other thing. So number of classes. So what would be the right number of classes for this, this, this problem? What do you think? Uh, 
Uh, there were okay. There you go. Two classes. Yeah, it's good. So the disease and no think, disease. And it's mentioned that there were some different severities and different disease types. Yeah. So. <clears throat> yeah. So if. And a hundred. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I'll go That's interesting, Charles. Yeah, number of diseases versus number of severities. But severities are they are they the same as disease classes? Have a think about that. And then. And did and did yeah well you could yeah so it's a so if you look at the yeah so this is sort of the the scope we are dealing with uh, so you have these severities uh, so you have well there are, there are more technical things for example severity one is really a healthy plant which is sort of healthy so you essentially have four severity levels more or less and then you have these five classes the healthy the healthy class doesn't have severities, of course. So you have maybe four diseases, uh, then you know, four severities per disease, and then you know you can sort of uh, you can sort of have a big big problem with many classes. So we decided to abstract that uh, and say, okay, let's just deal with these the top row, the five class problem, uh, the major diseases. Let's first try that out. We actually did try the two class problem, and then. Uh, sort of the five class problem. There, there was a comment, uh, Ernest, that there can be multiple diseases at once. Um, so do you consider uh, that each plant will only have one of the diseases? No. Um, yeah, you could you could label them differently with multiple uh, labels, multi-class, uh, multi-label sort of uh, setup. But what we did, we took the simplest um, simplest uh, simplest sort of setup where we just had uh, one class per, per, per image, one label per image. And sort of this is the top, top row. Why did we do that? Uh, partly because we didn't have enough data for all the other sort of setups. So with 10K images, you know, clean images, we could um, uh, get these, uh, these, the first sort of setup. <clears throat> Sorry. With a comment, but I so I commented under a hundred classes because it came up earlier in these lectures that you know one of the the reasons why ImageNet was so powerful is because you had lots of classes, you had thousand classes uh, of different kinds of breeds of dog, and that richness in the different classes is potentially what allowed uh, you know what made ImageNet such a useful data set. So I was wondering if um, in this particular case, presumably there are like different varieties of cassava, like different types of plants, and maybe potentially also classifying, like, you know, on the side, classifying other things that are might help you learn a better classifier because you're also, you know, a classifier receives more information. It also is trained to identify the different cassava varieties or something. Do you think that would be I, I understand that this is even more stuff that your labelers would have to to deal with, but do you think that it would help to add additional labels in addition to just a just focusing on the disease labels? Uh, so <clears throat> I suppose two two answers to that. Uh, one was the so this this is a so you you have also a, a practical aim for this. So you really want uh, the the experts at the, the National Research Organization here, and they are keen on these five diseases because they want to understand for sure what's happening. Also, the farmer, you know, if you give the farmer, you know, you have this classifier that sort of does multiple things, then they, they tend to find it confusing. But anyway, so you have the, the sort of scope localized also by the, the application of the thing. But I think the idea is good. And we actually tried the idea. And the way we did it is to, <clears throat> try and generate features from these other, other data sets. So maybe you get uh, an architecture like MobileNet, train it with a large um, 
a large data set with multiple things and then from there fine tune on, on, uh, on these few classes. So we try to leverage that, 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 that knowledge a bit. Um, yeah, but you know, the results are, uh, yeah, they're interesting. It's very hard to beat ImageNet in short. Um, so even <clears throat> pre-training uh, some architecture with some images that are related to plants, it does worse than if you trained it with just ImageNet, which has random objects. Um, but you know, maybe that's, uh, we can delve into that uh, at the end a bit. Um, yeah, so, ooh, uh, sorry, the time has gone. Let me see, would it be better to have several healthy versus disease classifiers that would be good at targeting one particular disease? Um, yeah, yeah, so perhaps that would be a better thing to do. Um, um, we, we didn't, uh, did we try and do that? We tried to do it, I think, when we still were doing, uh, uh, when we're still extracting sort of features manually uh, from these multiple uh, classes, because then you could use a small data set and you could be able to do this multi, multi class uh, thing. Uh, but when we got to trying it with some deep learning, we, we, we tried to, to constrain the problem to this small problem, partly because we had limited data and see how well it does. So how well does it do in identifying the top level diseases? And then from there, how well did it do to identify severities? So we didn't do much on severities, partly because of the data, but we did a lot of work on the classes. So maybe one, <clears throat> one thing uh, is to, uh, so the, the point I wanted to bring out with the classes here is that we found actually that we needed an extra class to make this robust. Um, we needed an extra class of unknown, an unknown class, right? So you, otherwise your algo, your model will always be predicting one of these things. So even if you have a random, uh, uh, random, um, a random image, you know, it predicts some sort of disease and this doesn't sound, when you're doing it in the lab, it doesn't sound uh, like something you should think about because no one is going to point at the sky and take an image with a classifier. But actually the farmers do this. So they, they, they'll take an image of a house and then it will say it's this disease. Um, and uh, then they have uh, limited faith in, uh, in this model. So you want an unknown class to, to be there for practical purposes. Uh, and so what we did, we got a bunch of images, some from, uh, I naturalist, if you know the data set of flowers or different plants or different diseases like with beans and then made that the unknown class and trained a six class problem. Uh, <clears throat> other things, image quality at input, very big, big problem, uh, very big problem. Um, so if the image is sort of hazy out of focus, then you get different things. So considerations there, do you build another classifier to do an image, uh, to check the quality of the image at input into the, the model, or do you actually build it into the, into the, the application? The very big problem. And then uh, <clears throat> input image or video. So if a farmer in the field, you know, is it taking an image of the plant or is it taking a video and then, you know, it's sort of, uh, takes out frames and then does classification as it goes. So the, yeah, so this, this is also a bit complicated, but we, we eventually settled on the image, just taking one image. Uh, it's less complicated to use, but initially we had sort of a video stream and, um, and the algorithm taking, uh, doing analysis on that. All right, so, and several other things you want to think about uh, all the new sort of techniques of modeling, you want to transfer learning, data augmentation is really important. Uh, and all manner of augmentation cropping from different places. Cause if you look at the images, you know, you have you know, different things. So you maybe you want to crop differently, uh, augment the, the data bit. We did a lot of transfer learning as I explained from uh, imagine it to find that work best for some strange reason, uh, and from all other types of um, of data like iNaturalist, which is sort of plants, you'd expect it to have uh, uh, to provide a good pre-trained um, network, but you know, 
not really. All right, and then the size of the train model, of course, this has implications on where you're going to deploy it. So these are considerations you want to make. And, um, yeah, so, <clears throat> uh, sorry, quickly moving on, it seems like time has, is not on our side. Uh, so accuracy was a big thing. What's sufficient accuracy for this application? Um, this was a big problem and we had to sort of sit down with um, the, <clears throat> with the, the experts and say, okay, what is sufficient accuracy? Is if I give you a model, which is 86% as a performance in accuracy of 86%, is that sufficient for you as a classifier to give to your farmers? Um, and then there are many things that come into that. Uh, and this is why errors is important. What, <clears throat> when you look at the errors that the model is making, can we learn anything from them? So ideally you'd want uh, diseases or classes which are very similar. You want the errors to sort of be uh, correlated. You want them to, if you have a confusion matrix, you want uh, the diseases to confuse uh, one for the other. You don't want them, you know, a healthy plant being confused as a totally a disease plant. So you, even the errors give you some idea of what the, the model is doing. So we had to look at that. Uh, and then of course you have all these things. You, do you want you know, uh, less specificity or more sensitivity in the algorithm? You know, if the farmer finds that, <clears throat> do you want to, the, the app to err on the side of telling the farmer, okay, it seems you have a disease here when it doesn't have a disease or to tell them, no, things are okay when they actually have a disease. So these are all considerations, you know, that you try and build into this. Uh, <clears throat> so deployment, uh, we had to deploy on the phone. This means uh, you have to quantize the models, so some quantization. Uh, I think we use TF light. And this means you make the models a bit smaller. You, you convert the floating point uh, weights of the model into integers, uh, just a different representation, it makes the model smaller, but then you degrade the accuracy. So, you know, you have a model running on your machine, which is different from the one on the phone. So you want to <clears throat> have this, uh, put this into consideration as well. We had issues with the phone display. So, you know, I think initially we had, um, we had the, the farmers look at the app, and it would give them a disease, and then it would also give them uh, some sort of probability uh, of diseases, of all the five diseases, five, four diseases and the healthy. And they found that very strange. They said, you know, it has many numbers, you know, they don't really understand what this means. So they preferred, you know, just one, one clear disease. So again, you know, how do you display the results uh, for a farmer and how do they use them? And I think this, this is something someone asked. Uh, I don't know who it was. So once you have the result, what do you actually do? Uh, if I build an app, give it to a farmer, it tells him it has this disease and he uproots all his crops and burns his field, you know, who, who's responsible for that? Uh, so what has come out of that? So this is a big, big problem. Uh, how do you, you know, guarantee the result of a model that you've built for actual use? And so this, this, this was a big problem. You know, you have, we had to go to the, the, the national put in charge of this and, you know, they have to own the results. They have to uh, maybe put someone in the middle to review it again. You know, these are all considerations when you want to sort of build a model to deploy. All right. Uh, how are we doing on time? Do we, should I go on to the next case or should we uh, sort of cover the questions around this? Maybe if you want to do highlights of this case, Ernest, um, and um, I'm certainly happy. I've made sure I've got time afterwards. If you're happy to stay on, we can do a more Q&A, ask you anything if you're happy to stay on afterwards, because I'm sure there are lots of questions, not just about the model, but about machine learning in the developing world as well. So maybe right, a quick cool. quick rush through of like the how, how this is related and then do some questions. All right, cool. Uh, I'll do a quick rush through. So this, <clears throat> so this is sort of uh, the same thing with cassava. So cassava is uh, the vectors that transmit cassava are called white flies. Uh, and so you want to count them. Uh, 
so this this is sort of what they look like. And so the, the first time we took to the experts and showed them this really cool app that does disease diagnostics using images, they sort of said, yeah, diseases, we can handle diseases. We know what diseases look like. Um, but what's really, really maddening for us is these sort of white flies. These are the vectors that carry the disease. And they wanted us to build a system that sort of counts these things. So they have to do the count in order to understand how the disease spreads or you know, uh, predict how to spread given the different counts of these, um, these vectors. So these small white things on the leaf are actually small white flies. So you want to count them. So you can imagine if you're counting them physically, you know, it's, a, it's quite a big problem. So you can understand why they would want to automate this. And <clears throat> why is this a hard problem for, for computational methods like you know, neural networks? Of course, there's so many inherent inaccuracies in this. Uh, so if you look at the, this area here, you have sort of white flies which are together. Sometimes you find them clustered together. Uh, and so you do, is that one count? Is it two counts? Then you have those that are flying. So the moment you take an image, um, you still have some that are flying. Um, this is a problem. Then you have some things in the background. For example, they normally want a count per leaf, but you see leaves sort of, it's a plant, so leaves uh, interfere with each other. So you maybe you get different, um, different types of counts. Then the leaf angle, how it's bent, uh, give you all these artifacts. So they, these inherent things in the data that make the problem quite hard. It's not a, a straightforward problem of counting. And um, <clears throat> so many, many issues also come into col in the collection of data. One, key, one big problem was resolution of images. Um, so if, if, you, if you go in very, if you want a, a, a very high resolution, you want something near so that you can really identify the things, then you can't get the whole image. You won't get the, the whole leaf. You sort of get a portion of the leaf. If you zoom out uh, quite a bit to get the whole leaf, then the images are really small and they're very hard to deal with, with um, these sort of neural networks, region-based neural networks. Uh, then background, do you remove the background? Do you not? Um, then <clears throat> classification. So you want to also describe the problem. Do you want to do a classification problem? Where are you saying, okay, there's many, there's a lot of flies here, few flies, or do you want to do an object sort of recognition problem? Where I actually count all the different flies and then labeling uh, tends to be complicated. How do you label clustered white flies? Anyway, so <clears throat> several, again, again, several things you have to consider, or at least things we had to consider. Uh, do you do uh, you know, the region-based uh, neural networks, which are really, they have uh, good accuracy, or do you sort of go for, you look once um, type of models, which are much faster, almost real time, but you know the, the accuracy suffers. Again, input images or videos. Um, this is a, a, a big problem. Okay, I think I put it that. <clears throat> but also accuracies of the count. Do you want you know how, how accurate is the count given all those uh, artifacts in the image? And again, phone all. Uh, online deployment, and it was in the later slides we actually went for eventually for the online deployment because in the field it takes a lot of time for the phone to to run these models, and then integration with the other apps, very big consideration. And <clears throat> you know this is sort of one image where you really see you know things totally break down, so neural networks can can solve this for you. Um, this is called super abundant, uh, sort of infestation of white flies. Uh, getting the accurate count here is, uh, yeah, is a task for serious experts. All right, and sort of the last last sort of application again related to this is um, necrosis detection. So these images are for a cross section of a, a cassava root, the tuber, the thing that you eat. And the idea here is to find the proportion of the root that is necrotized, so that has these brown patches. And so this is important for breeders because they want to understand how um, disease evolves in these, in these cassava tubers. 
So this is a very bad disease because it can eat up the whole plant and you wouldn't know about it until you sort of slice the, the tube and then you see that's totally infested and you can't eat it. So this problem was really for the experts who want to understand different varieties and how disease spreads in the different varieties. And so the, the goal there is really to, to do some sort of semantic segmentation. You want to understand what percentage of the cross section is, uh, is this brown part. And <clears throat> you want to do it in the field. So this image on the left is someone doing it in the field. And that's very, uh, very complicated in the field. Um, the sun, the angle, uh, etc. And so again, <clears throat> for this one, the problem is that it's destructive. So the root is under the, you need to uproot the plant, cut off the tuber and then collect data. So that's, that's going to be a problem. And there are many image artifacts, shadows, soil, soil looks like a brown part. So, you know, you have to, they have to do the slices very cleanly, the, uh, the very clean knife, um, make sure soil doesn't get in and you have to do it in the field. So there are all these uh, sort of artifacts that come in. And then how do you label it? You, know, you have to figure out a good way of labeling it. Um, and um, again, you know, you have to think of architecture, leveraging some of the, uh, the, the advances in neural network learning and, you know, this problem of domain validation, you know, how, how do they evaluate it now and how is it evaluated? So for example, we had a problem, um, the experts evaluate on a, a scale of one to five. Uh, our models are giving a percentage and these two things sort of don't connect. So that's a problem there and actually practically deploying it. <clears throat> and if only first time was the biggest problem with this application actually. So the, the, how much time does it take to do this in the field? So to get an, a, a, a sample with a phone and take an image and then processes and gets the regions and calculates, it takes, I think it was, I think maybe four or five seconds above the time that an expert would sort of look at it and move on. And this became a huge problem. Um, all right, so yeah, this is the final sort of, uh, eventually we deployed some of these things online. And uh, yeah, several considerations, but I, I think I'll stop there and uh, invite any questions. Brilliant, there's a few more questions in the chat. Um, but we can also give, I'm very happy to stay on and host, uh, I've got quite a bit of time. Uh, as long as Ernest is happy to answer questions. Um, but perhaps I'll stop recording now and then we can make it a bit more informal and people obviously can drop off if uh, they, they have something to do at three. <laughs>